I've been a fan of Chris Bowles for a long time. Um, Chris is a partner at Red Seed Ventures. Red Seed Ventures partners with high profile individuals and brands to build unique digital businesses. Initial clients include Premier Networks and motion picture producer Blumhouse. Make my favorite movies. Uh, prior to founding Red Seat, Chris was president and COO of Mercury Radio Arts as well as CEO of The Blaze, that would be Glenn Beck's company. The Blaze pioneered a brand new direct to consumer, consumer subscription model, while TheBlaze.com became one of the top 100 websites in the world. Please welcome Chris Bell. Chris, you are like a, um, a secret, you know? There's like, <laughs> what is Chris doing? Nobody really knows what Chris is doing. You even explain what you're doing, and people say, well, wait, what is Chris doing? Well, that's not good. That means I'm terrible at explaining No, 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 it do. means you've got a lot cooking uh, under okay. the hood that you haven't revealed yet. That's what we're going to do today. Okay, good. Um, explain to me what Red Seed Ventures does and, and why it matters. Yeah, I mean, it really was born out of need, which was we had built... Um, in partnership with Glenn, this incredible, um, you know, direct-to-consumer subscription business, this big news and information website, all of the other things that we built at, at uh, the Blaze and Mercury, and uh, you know, a lot of talent looked at what we did and said, "I want to do some of that." You know, I, I want to be a part of of really understanding how to build my own platform, and I think right now that's more important than ever. The, the idea that. Uh, you know, content is king, something we've all said forever. Right now, talent is king, and distribution is getting less and less valuable, as all of the folks here know. Um, and, and also, I think that what, what digital is is changing, right? Is Facebook Live television, or is Facebook Live digital? And for us to partner with talent and help them figure that out from a 360-degree perspective is really what we do. Um, and, and there's really two facets to that. One is we build for talent whatever we think they need. So it could be, uh, in the case of Mike Rowe, I'm sure we'll talk about uh, just a podcast, or it could be, um, in the case of some of the folks that we're working with at Premier, a 360-degree view of their world. And uh, one of the parts about that that I think is, is uh, important is it's not all OTT, right? We do get everybody who thinks about launching a direct consumer subscription business calls us, and. Of course, we love that, uh, but it's not right. It's not the right platform for everyone. So we build the right platform, and we also uh, provide resources that most talent don't have in-house. We have amazing tech people. We have amazing editorial, social people. And most talent, as they're thinking about their world, some of that lives in their radio syndicator. Some of that lives in their TV business. Maybe they have a digital agency involved in that. And we really bring all that together, negotiate a, a single strategy for them to have a digital presence that they really need. It seems so loosey-goosey, though. I mean, you know, if you talk about somebody like Mike Rowe, yeah. who everybody, you should explain who Mike Rowe is. Sure. And, and why you thought that the podcast was the solution for Mike Rowe. Sure. I mean, Mike Rowe is uh, the dirty jobs guy. is the way he's best known. He uh, also just did a show for CNN. Um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of uh, television that he's done. But um, he, he also is a, is a really great voiceover guy. And he's done, you know, uh, voiceover for, you know, hundreds of shows. Um, but what, what attracted us to him was authenticity and a connection with his fan base where he had over 3 million Facebook fans in real engagement, you know. Um, so when Mike called us with the idea, we, weren't, we didn't go out and pitch him. He, he said, you know, we've got this idea for, you know, I really love Paul Harvey. I really love the rest of the story. And there's an opportunity for that now. Um, and so this we, is what he said to this you. This is what he said to us. And, and so we really helped him develop the, the podcast that he already knew he wanted, but he didn't have people who knew how to sell podcasts. He didn't know people how to distribute it, how to have relationships with um, you know, partners to promote it. And so uh, you know, we brought that side of it to the table. But you know, look, I, I think there's a big opportunity across the board for Mike in, in video and other things. But we always like to say, well, let's get in. Let's have one big success. And then we'll figure out other, other things to work and on. And talk about the metrics, because it has been a big success. It's been a huge success. I mean, Mike's podcast has been on the top 50 on iTunes since we launched it, which is, uh, I don't know, 18 weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, over 3 million downloads so far. Um, for a once a week podcast, and it's only about a seven minute podcast. It's mm -hmm. really short. Um, you know, again, rest of the story, you know, even longer than rest of the story, but um, it's, it's, a, it's, uh, it's authentic to who he is as a broadcaster, mm -hmm. right? He, people, he loves to tell these stories, and that, that uh, passion and enthusiasm comes through and has been a huge hit and has developed at Red Sea what I like to call podcast mania, which is 
there is uh, such demand for this podcast from the talent agency side because it's so effective for advertisers, because it's so hot, that uh, it's led us now to get much, much more aggressive about developing original podcasts. That's interesting. <coughs> so um, when you say much more aggressive, so let's talk about Blumhouse because that's a good example. I yeah. think the best way often to tell your story is to, is to use the examples of how you actually work with people. Yeah. There's a company that uh, produces movies, yep. right? And now, thanks to you, they do blank. Yeah, I mean, they're really becoming a media company. And Blumhouse is founded by a guy named Jason Blum, who's incredibly smart and aggressive and um, really had been in the movie business for a long time. But uh, the, the creation of Blumhouse came from uh, Paranormal Activity, which was a film that was made for, you know, the le as the legend goes, was made for $15,000 and went on to gross over $200 million. Um, and this micro-budget horror uh, film business that he created is now includes The Purge and Insidious and Sinister and all these movies that I can't watch because I won't be able to sleep. I love them all. Uh, yeah, they're, they're great. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, what we found fascinating about Blumhouse was that the audience for the films is 60% under 25, mm -hmm. really young, it skews a little bit female, and it's, um, it's very diverse. 20% Hispanic is, is one example. So that is sort of a, a millennial advertiser's dream audience. And we thought, how can we build a, a real media company to sell our audience, or Blumhouse's audience, to companies that really want to reach that? And so we started with Blumhouse.com, somewhat traditional, um, you know, news sort of a horror scary home. You know, we like to say the home for all things scary, which it sure includes news about horror films, but also like, you know, the guy who reaches his arm into a wall and comes out with an arm full of spiders. Like the video <laughs> that you're just like, oh my God, like it's so scary. I can't even I want to Google it right now. Oh yeah, please don't. Um, but it's, it's uh, you know, the home for all things scary. And what we've, and it's succeeded. You know, we're doing millions and millions of unique visitors that are, uh, that are right in the demo of the folks who are coming to see his, his films. And so from there, you know, when we look, when we set out to build these companies, it really starts, we just kind of go step by step by step. And the next step that made sense to us in, in the Blumhouse media world was podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there was uh, the existing managing editor of the, of the site does a podcast now for us called Shock Waves um, that's really into the horror space, uh, an hour long, amazing horror guests, free ranging types of conversation. And, um, you know, it's been written up at AV Club and Entertainment Weekly and other places. Um, now we're looking at the next development process, sort of like they do with films, and saying, you know, pitch us great horror stories. Now we want to create the paranormal activity version of this, the, the podcast that is so scary that you can't listen to it before bed. Mm -hmm. um, and we're getting lots of, you know, awesome pitches from, from folks on that kind of stuff. So I think it... it uh, audio is going to be an, a, a really great part of the overall Blumhouse media business. Here's what's interesting to me about what you're describing, because in a sense, these elements like horror news and horror podcasts, there's nothing special about these. But all of these make sense as ornaments, as extensions of the Blumhouse brand, because they can leverage off that existing Blumhouse loyal audience, right? And so take them to new places. And that is why it's because of that original audience and that Blumhouse brand that you're able to get attention in Entertainment Weekly and other platforms too. Right. So you accomplish both things without you know, content that is utterly novel and original. It's just it's the right content matched with the right brand. And now because it's new to the brand and it fits that brand persona, it gets attention, it gets earned media. Yeah, and we always say when we look at who we want to work with and you know, what, the, what are the platforms we want to build, we want to have in every case one unfair advantage. What's our, if we were, you know, I could probably create a horror business, but I don't know anything about horror, you know, what's our unfair advantage? In the case, it, it's Blumhouse, right? These guys know everything. They have all the connections. They have, um, you know, they're a respected brand in the business. You know, what's the case, what's our unfair advantage with Mike Rowe? You know, I could create a Paul Harvey knockoff podcast. Well, that's not what we did. What we created was a podcast that was authentic to who Mike was, and Mike is our unfair advantage. So, you know, we look at that in each case of, of a business or talent or a brand that we want to partner with. What is, what is it that we're going to be able to do? Because the barrier to entry in digital is so low, right. you know, and getting lower every day, what can we bring to the table that no one else can? It also feels to <coughs> me like your role is kind of like an agent in the sense that it's not just about people coming to you and say, hey, Chris, build me an empire like Glenn's. It's you actually choosing who you want to associate with. You have some kind of 
parameters. Like, what are those parameters? Who do you look to partner with? I mean, it starts with uh, who we think has a direct connection with their audience. And I always like to say, you know, what's a proxy for a direct connection with your audience? It's, um, in some ways, it's Facebook fans and engagement on Facebook. Um, the number one thing that, that is easy for us to tell is book sales, right? If somebody's on TV and they have five million people watching the nightly news, okay, that, that means people know who they are. It doesn't necessarily mean people like them or want to consume more from them. Um, whereas someone who has sold 50,000, 100,000, a million books, these are people who nobody reads books anymore, right? People, so these people had to go to a Barnes and Noble. It's a miracle. Right, yeah. Or, and they had to find this book and they would go to Amazon. And I, I think that that shows a level of engagement and caring about the talent that, is, that, is, that gives a signal to us of, okay, this guy's got real fans or gal has real fans, and um, it's someone that we want to be in business so with. So you're looking for some balance of scale and engage commitment, right, on the basis of the fans? Yeah. Okay. So if uh, Howard Stern came to you, um, what would you do for him? You know, we specialize, I think, in these, these talent that are their own planet. You know, they're, they're, Howard Stern is his own planet, and he's got television, and he's got radio, and he's got all these things. Um, but sometimes that complexity is the problem and there isn't anyone in the driver's seat specifically thinking about digital. That's where we come in. So with Howard, I think, you know, one of the things that he doesn't do well, he does so much well, but one of the things he doesn't do well is, is social. Um, he does amazing interviews. Everybody's talking about him the next day, but they don't get shared socially the same way that Jimmy Fallon's interviews get shared. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still recovering from a cold here. So, um, you know, I think that creating, taking the content that he's already creating and making it shareable mm -hmm. for social media consumption is, uh, you know, a place that we would really start with Howard. Okay. So uh, what would that look like or sound like or feel like? You know, what, what's that process like? Really, it starts with finding, uh, it starts from an editorial perspective. It starts by finding what we call a managing editor, but it's more than that. Um, a producer, a uh, jack of all trades. Is this someone on the, si on the brand side or on your side? Uh, usually we're, they, they work for us, okay. um, but the closer that they can be embedded with the talent, the better. And uh, someone who can really listen to the show, talk to all the players, and figure out how do we translate the best of what's happening on radio, TV, and, and the rest of their life to digital, to original Facebook video, to podcasts, to the web, to, to really all of the platforms that are available to us as we think about um, you know, what this digital presence should look like. How do you make those decisions, though? I mean, there is, a, there is just so many alternatives in that space. How do you choose between them? Well, we, we have great, uh, you know, thankfully it's not just me at Red Sea. We have a guy named Joel Cheatwood who, is, uh, who runs programming for us. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our partners, he ran program development for Fox News Channel and for CNN before that. Um, and so we have real editorial pros who can listen to the shows, who can think about what are, the, what are the unique advantages that this talent has with their audience, and how do we highlight that for digital? Okay, so um, how does that help you choose between platforms? Well, choosing between platforms tends to be, um, I guess I don't know. I guess I would say we, we think about it and we decide, and uh, you know, we think what is, you know, is, is the podcast the right next step for this person? Is the, uh, is the original, you know, do they have the time? A lot of the folks that we work with already have a three hour radio show and an hour television mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of me showing up to them and saying, we're gonna build this amazing digital business and by the way, we need three more hours of your day is not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, and most of them <laughs> are already making tens of millions of dollars too, right? And, and that would be the case in Howard's world. the podcast world. isn't exciting to them when yeah, they're making tens of millions? Yeah, it, sometimes it's, it's a little bit challenging, but that, but, but to us, the first place to start, I, I think ultimately there is a focus on original content for, the, for digital, but the place to start is you're already doing an incredible three-hour radio show a day. You're already doing an hour of television. Let's use that content. Let's make sure that, you know, we all know what the TSL is of a radio show. We all know that you're not watching every single minute of the television show, and stuff is happening, and it's getting shared, and, and it's exposing you to new fans. And I think that's the case, you know, that would be, I think, so valuable with Howard is, I think that I was, you know, growing up, I was an I Miss fan and not a Stern fan. 
Um, and now, as I've gotten older, and everyone talks about how um, Howard's interviews are amazing, I've been more interested in consuming that content, but I don't really see it in my Facebook feed, and it really doesn't really get shared with me, and so I don't. And so I think that Planet Howard is a little bit contained and, and could be opened up. Can you talk at all about uh, some of the projects you're working on? I know you can't make any announcements today, mm -hmm. but if you can just tease kind of the areas you're you're moving into. Yeah, and I think we've talked about it a little bit, which is, uh, you know, we, we have a partnership with Premier Networks, and, you know, Premier has the best talent, in, in, in my view, from the terrestrial space, um, but hasn't uh, taken that much advantage yet of the digital opportunities mm -hmm. in the way that we did, for example, with Glenn. And so we're really working with Premier and the talents, and, and it really has to be a collaboration between us. Premier in the network side and a talent who really wants to opt in and say yes I want to make an investment in digital. I want to step up my game here um, And therefore, you know, let's bring Red Sea to the table. Okay um, What do people who spend every day in the audio space need to understand about the digital transition? Why what do they need to know? I mean, I think the first thing is you know one of the things that's cool about it and going back to Mike Rowe is when Mike came to us I thought you know, I, I did think that the idea was a hit right away you did uh, not. I did. Oh, you I did. did. I, I thought it was a hit. I, you know, I, I thought he was going to be great, um, and it was. But I love radio, and you know, I worked for for Glenn for twelve years, and so my first calls were to radio syndication partners and to to say to stations and to say this this is the next Paul Harvey. This is um, good enough that it should be on radio, and it really I really couldn't get traction because. The format limitations of radio are such that, you know, look, radio, grew, especially talk, grew up with Rush Limbaugh. And so if shows are not formatted in a certain way, they don't have a great home. Our litmus test for, for a long time was, what station would run this? You know, if, if mm -hmm. there's no home for this, this product, then what, why are we creating it? Mm -hmm. um, now, with podcasts, that's over. And the idea that we can create something that doesn't have to have a home uh, for distribution anymore if it's good enough where people are going to find it. That's, to me, the most important thing to understand is, is Mike Rowe uh, belongs on radio. Eventually, probably, they'll come around. Um, but, now, uh, but for now, it's doing great. And you know, it, if, if it never gets to radio, you know, that's radio's loss, not Mike's. Well, that was my last question, which is, what are the consequences of that fact, that there, there are rules and strictures with radio that don't exist on these other platforms? What does that mean for broadcasters? What do they need to know about that? I mean, I think that broadcasters, especially the, the big radio companies, have, uh, they, you know, we all get on them for not making investments in talent, and a lot of that's true. But at the network level, there, there's great talent. Um, and yet they haven't, in a, in a lot of cases, they've allowed the folks in this room to eat their lunch because they haven't been as aggressive as they need to be in uh, getting into on-demand audio or podcasts or getting into to, you know, Facebook Live video and some of these other places. And some of the podcasts that are out there are inferior to the, to the radio programs that are being done by traditional broadcasters. Some of these guys are making millions of dollars because they're really, really good. Mm -hmm. And bringing those folks to, to digital before it's too late and a whole new series of talent have cropped up in their place is what I would emphasize broadcasters to focus on is, you know, now or never. Like, let's, let's get these folks out there and exposed to the next generation of audiences who are consuming this content digital only. Mm -hmm. Chris Balf, Red Sea Adventures. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks.